I made a quip before about having grand students, uh, but you know you can emphasize it in different ways. I have been privileged to have some really grand students. So uh, truly, and that wasn't a cheap pun. It was coming from the heart. What came came from the heart. Um, This day has, has really been wonderful for me uh, to, there's so many people in this room I've uh, not only been glad to meet, but so many I've been so happy to see again. I didn't realize how many uh, th there would be who are really part of uh, my life. And it's been such a warm reception. I just wish that there were time, more time for those of us who have things to catch up on and those of us who have maybe <laughs> friendships to build to do that, but I hope that we will be able to, to do that more in the future. Uh, you know, a lot has been said about hope. So here's a, you know, take a look at the moon tonight. You know, two more times you see the moon looking like that, you'll be sitting in the sukkah. It'll be over, right? So there, there, is, there is hope, okay? So I am going to uh, shift gears right now because we're going from uh, Rosh Hashanah to Yom Kippur. Um, which, um, you know, sometimes we just lump them all together, you know, the Yamim Norayim. Uh, but uh, even the liturgy tells us these are, these are different days. And uh, sometimes that gets uh, smudged a little bit because we use the same Nusach and all of that, but they're really quite different. And I learned that very early on in my congregational rabbinate. Um, if, uh, this morning I was uh, talking about uh, the passionate love of one's people and the moral ideals for the world. Uh, for me, Yom Kippur uh, very, very quickly became um, about the spiritual and the existential in people's lives. Uh, just as a parenthetical, um, I did, um, as you know, or if you didn't know, you heard, uh, I kind of went from the academic world to the world of the congregational rabbinate. And people in the early years asked me, you know, what that was like. Uh, and I think I, I had a sense that um, a lot of them um, imagined that somehow I, this was uh, going from something a little more lofty to something more, uh, you know, down and dirty and involved with the nitty gritty of things. And they were, uh, they were always surprised when I said to them, um, and it became more and more true over the years, that this was such a step up in terms of my personal spirituality. Um, and it continues to be, and it has been, it's been um, one, of, uh, one of the great gifts. Um, the, I am so happy that the word hope has been heard so many times here today. I mentioned it this morning. Uh, saying that that's part of what our vocation truly is. Um, it, was, it came up uh, several times in, uh, in the writer's workshop I was in. It's been talked about here uh, by, by the consul uh, and by others. I think it is uh, truly important, and I'm going to start this with a little story about a big mistake I made. It was uh, Yom Kippur in the year 2000, it was only about 14 years ago. The, uh, the, uh, what's called the Second Intifada had started uh, a week before. This may have been true for many of you, and it was true the next year for Rosh Hashanah. Many of us uh, you know, crumbled up whatever we had written and thought to speak about on Yom Kippur and kind of started over. And it was dark. It was really dark, and I had uh, I, I had recently uh, reread a kind of a classic little book called *Revolutionary Immortality* by Robert J. Lifton, in which he talked about what 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 was the what were the horrors of the Cultural Revolution in China about, and uh, he concluded, uh, you know, as a as a psychoanalyst, that what had what had happened is that revolutionaries have this have this fear not only of dying, but of the revolution dying with them. So even though it may even be one, as it was in China, it's got to be started again and again and again and again. The revolution has to be immortal. And, you can, and, what, and it struck me that what, what had happened is that all this idea that 
we, we might be really close to a, to a peace agreement, that something might actually be happening. And it was so close that it had, this syndrome had taken over Arafat and, and had to unleash a new whatever. And it was, um, it was despair. And when I was done, uh, walked back to my seat on the beam of the president was uh, there to greet me. And he said, trying to be nice, he said, um, very well said. And then said, it's terrible to have to hear this on Yom Kippur. And I realized that I had really let him and the congregation down. Uh, people in these, in these moments, particularly of Yom Kippur, um, they, need, they need hope. It's the only word for it. They need hope. They don't need dark despair. That doesn't mean they need unrealistic hope. Obviously not. Not Pollyannish hope. But uh, they need hope. And they need hope uh, not so much um, as I signaled you already about the world events. They need hope for their lives. So we're going to talk about some of these um, existential issues for, on the personal level. I uh, remember very well my f own first encounter with the primal existential issue of death. Uh, at least it was my first conscious encounter. I was eight years old, and I was contemplating the reality of the death of a close friend's grandmother. It was a woman I had known uh, very well myself my whole life. And this was uh, my first moment of saying, what, is this, what does this mean for my own life? The, cl the world was clearly going on without Mrs. Rabinowitz. So was the world going to go on without me as well? Apparently so. But then what's the meaning of it all? And I began to construct in my eight-year-old head the set of questions that stare at us from the pages of the Mahsa when we get to Ne'ila. And we're about to re-enter the ordinary world. What a time to be asking ourselves, ma'anu, mechayenu, mechastenu, makochenu, magvuratenu. What are we? Of what significance of our li are our lives, our various strengths, our whatever power of chesed and grace we have, our supposed power? Is it all an illusion? Uh, ever since uh, I've began to focus on this uh, in my rabbinate, I've been calling them in my own mind, these are the Ne'ila questions. And uh, when I was eight years old, of course, I didn't necessarily realize that at the time, I certainly didn't realize it, but the stakes for each of us and for the world are quite high in how we can honestly answer those questions for ourselves. Here's a verse that appears in the Torah. Um, we read it two weeks before Rosh Hashanah, Parshat Ki Tavo. Now, the JPS translates Velo Ta'amin Bechayecha as with no assurance of survival. Robert Alter translates it as you will have no faith in your life. You know the bracha chacham harazim? When you see ochlosiat Yisrael, when you see the masses of Jews in one place, they're supposed to say this bracha. Baruch chacham harazim, the one who's wise to all secrets. I feel like the subject of that, I know you do too, you may not have thought of it. When you're standing up on the bima, looking out at these thousands of people there, 1,500 people, 1,800 people on Kol Nidre night, and you think, how many secrets you know that you wish you didn't know, and, and, and you're seeing it all out there. It's, it can be overwhelming. 
thousands who are, who are all together and uh, are drawn to be together, but you know in some ways are standing there alone. And they're standing there with the terrifying Ni'ila questions. And so just as the prophets were once told, again, timely, still ringing in our ears, Nachamu, Nachamu, Ami, the prophets were exhorted, go give my people comfort, go give them hope. Uh, we are the deliverers of hope. Or that's what we should be striving to be. Newly, uh, 20 years ago, uh, the sociologist Richard Sennett made some very penetrating observations as he surveyed the contemporary scene and how our economic environment and our spiritual health are interdependent. This came to the fore again at the time of the economic crash about six years ago. The book was entitled The Corrosion of Character. And he couldn't have been more on target with the things he wrote in the late 90s, nor more eerily prescient with respect to where we are today. He pointed out that the phrase, no long term, remember the two most dangerous words in the Hebrew language, maybe the three most dangerous words in the English language, no long term was already in the late 90s a virtual motto of most Americans' business and professional life. Uh, he wrote at the time, I suspect it may be even more extreme today, that a young American with at least two years of college could expect to change jobs at least 11 times in the course of working. Not like my late father-in-law, for example, who by, was by any standard highly successful and who stayed with the same corporation for over 50 years, never really entertaining the thought of moving elsewhere since this is where his career and his character and his commitments were being played out. The absence of a long term is a phenomenon that corrodes trust and loyalty and mutual commitment. It distorts actions that need to be taken and decisions that need to be made for the sake of the longer horizons that define our lives in more meaningful terms. It's worth uh, spending a few moments on what, uh, what Senate found. He spent some time with a young man that he, uh, he called Rico, whose father he had known years ago. Uh, Rico's father was a blue collar worker who lived and worked a life of long trajectory, pursuing a goal of saving and improving his conditions and those of his children. Patience, he had. Tenacity, he had. Commitment, he had. Rico had many more material things than his father ever dreamed of, but lived in a world marked by flux. A world that didn't offer much economically or socially in the way of long-term sustaining narrative. But it is, as we should know from our Jewish lives, it is precisely long-term narratives that guide our thinking and our acting to values that are lasting and enduring, and not just of uh, the immediate moment. And the short-term culture in which we live brings about a corrosion of character. By that, I don't mean we're bad people. We're not bad people. That's not what character means in this context. Character is a good sense of who we are, ma'anu, what our lives are about, careers that have long-term meaning and that they produce something of enduring value tangible or intangible, and ideally wealth as well, but not merely wealth. Character comes from having a long-term narrative of which we are now, because of our culture and our work lives, largely deprived. When Rico was forced to think about these matters in these interviews and how they relate to his life, he made the following extraordinary and revealing confession. He said, you can't imagine how stupid I feel when I talk to my kids about commitment. It's an abstract virtue to them because they don't see it anywhere. And one of the, one of the big questions is not quite there in the Ne'ila questions, but it's implied in all of them. It is also, who needs me?
Look at text number one that's been handed out. You've probably been looking at it already, but uh, it's okay. It's all right. You see, it starts with manu, mechayenu, mechastenu, makochenu, magvuratenu. It's about meaning in life. Uh, in his story, Babylon Revisited, this is the basis of a movie some of you may remember with uh, Van Johnson and Elizabeth Taylor, uh, The Last Time I Saw Paris. Anyone remember that movie? Yeah? Wow. Yeah. Yeah, well, you've got a white mustache, too. Right, OK. Uh, F. Scott Fitzgerald delivered in the wake of the 29 crash one of the most concisely devastating verdicts on what had happened to a culture during the good times in the 20s. Charlie Wales was in a bar in Paris, and the bartender said to him, I heard you lost a lot in the crash. And Charlie said, I, I did. And then he added grimly, but I lost everything I wanted in the boom. Bartender is puzzled. He said, selling short? And Charlie's answer is something like that. Right, the bartender is trying to imagine how could, how could anyone lose so much in the boom and decided he must have been selling short. That's how you lose in a boom. But uh, Charlie had not sold short in that sense. He was now using the term differently, something like that to refer to the love, loyalty, commitment, and understanding of what life is truly about, values that he had sold short, and in so doing, brought on a very different kind of bankruptcy. And just for good measure, for those of you who have never read this little short novel by Tolstoy, The Death of Ivan Ilyich, uh, it's, a, it's a kick in the gut, but it's an important kick in the gut. Man who had lived, uh, as a judge, had lived a very conventional life according to all the rules of society and was dying an agonizingly, physically agonizing death. The doctor said his physical agony was dreadful and that was true. But even more dreadful was his moral agony and it was this that tormented him most. He suddenly asked himself, what if my entire life, my entire conscious life simply was not the real thing? It occurred to him that what had seemed utterly inconceivable before, that he had not lived the kind of life he should have, obviously I did, might in fact be true. It occurred to him that those scarcely perceptible impulses of his to protest what people of high rank considered good, vague impulses that he had always suppressed, might have been precisely what mattered and all the rest had not been the real thing. His official duties, his manner of life, his families, the values adhered to by people in society and in his profession, all these might not have been the real thing. He tried to come up with a defense of these things and suddenly became aware of the insubstantiality of them all. And if you think people aren't thinking that out there in the collective loneliness on Yom Kippur, um, you're being probably overly optimistic. And this is another way of asking that question, who needs me? A lot of ways of framing that question, right? Who needs me, right? Who needs me? So I want to talk now about the various antidotes to this kind of loneliness and this kind of terror before the Ne'ila questions. And um, basically five things. I could have given you 15 things, I think, thinking back around around all the thoughts I've had over the years about dealing with this. Relationship, forgiveness, time with oneself, an interesting way to think about it as an antidote to loneliness, time with oneself, overcoming denial, and recollection. So five things. Let's, let's dip into each of them a little bit. Relationship. So here's some very compelling research that was published in September of 2008 uh, in the Journal of Experimental Social Psychology. Uh, a professor at uh, the Wurzweiler School uh, in New York uh, brought this uh, to my and to my co colleagues' attention back then. 
the visual perception, some of you may know this and may have read about this, the visual perception of geographical slant. How steep is that hill down to the valley? Okay. The, the visual perception of geographical slant is influenced by physiological resources such as physical fitness, age, and being physically refreshed. We all know that. But in two studies, they tested whether a psychosocial resource, social support, can also affect the visual perception of slants. Partists slants, slopes. Participants who were accompanied by a friend estimated a hill to be less steep when compared to participants who were alone. Sweet. Better. Participants who only thought of a supportive friend during an imagery task saw a hill as less steep than participants who either thought of a neutral person or a person they disliked. <laughs> the psychosocial element of what the challenges of life look like to you. In both studies, the effects of social relationships on visual perception appear to be mediated by relationship quality. That is, the more enduring the relationship, the greater the interpersonal closeness, the greater the warmth between the people, the less forbidding and foreboding the hill looks. And artifacts such as mood, social desirability, and social facilitation were all controlled for and did not account for these effects. So all those lonely people need to be reminded of that. Who needs me? Plenty of people need you, because every single one of them is facing hills. And your being there with them is making those hills seem less unconquerable. So here's another antidote. And uh, it's, an, it's a word that I've heard used uh, here today as well, which I'm happy about. And the word is gratitude. So um, now you can go back to your sheet, but on the second side, I've lost where my sheet is somehow. I threw it under here. Uh, you, you have an extra one there? We'll get back to the other texts here. So researchers asked 700 students ages 10 to 14, you see where I am on page two? To complete questionnaires in their classroom about how grateful they are for things in their lives. This was reported two years ago at the APA. They asked it again four years later to provide comparison data. And when comparing the results of the least grateful 20% of the students with the most grateful 20%, they found that teens with the most gratitude by the end of the four-year period had gained 15% more of a sense of meaning in their life, had better answers to the Ne'ila questions, become 15% more satisfied with their life overall, become 17% more happy and more hopeful about their lives, hopeful, and experienced a 13% drop in negative emotions and a 15% drop in depressive symptoms. By the way, the, um, at age, uh, some of you know the work of uh, Tal Ben Shachar, who's written on happiness. And he has documented how by age 14 and a half, uh, there is a significant uptick of teenagers starting to show depressive symptoms because precisely of the impact of these not well answered Ne'ila questions, as I call them. And uh, it's, worth, uh, it's worth thinking about, by the way, just uh, how, we begin, how we begin each morning and how we end our lives. Right? We begin and end with modern ilafanecha. 
Right? We think of vidui as confession. But the word vidui means acknowledgement. It's like vidui maaser. You're acknowledging. That's what it means to acknowledge. Sometimes you're acknowledging a sin, then it's a confession. Sometimes you're acknowledging a gift, then it's a thank you. But it's all the same word. Uh, and uh, we begin each morning, each, each time we come back to life, we begin with modern ilafenech, and we end with modern. The, the tradition is telling us something about this power of gratitude. And it reminds me of um, this kind of a classic cartoon that I don't know how many years ago it appeared in the New Yorker. I didn't see it when it was first there, but I've seen reproductions of it any, any number of times since. It shows a man standing under a tree, and there's a bird chirping away on the, on the branch right above him. And the bird says to the man, I don't sing because I'm happy. I'm happy because I sing. Right, so just translate it here. I'm not grateful because I'm happy. I'm happy because I'm grateful. And that is a really important antidote to the terror that is visiting our people out there when we look at them and are moved perhaps to say that difficult bracha chacham harazim. So that's relationship. And gratitude is part of that. Let's talk about forgiveness. I'm sure many of you read that book. It was a pretty popular book um, a couple of years ago. I guess it was about two years ago, two to two and a half years ago, called um, The Righteous Mind, Jonathan Haidt. Um, if you haven't, well worth it. Short crazy of some of the insights the author offers us, which is about the ways in which we, uh, we create tension with others and we create uh, estrangement from others. He said, when an idea is proposed that touches an intuitive chord with us, whatever the idea is, it could be a political idea, it could be a moral idea, it could be whatever it is. Someone proposes an idea that touches an intuitive chord, we then set about finding whatever evidence we can to support that intuitive chord. We don't go looking for all the evidence. We go looking for the evidence. It's, you know, it's like you have a certain idea. You're going to turn on MSNBC to get it corroborated. Or you're going to turn on Fox News to get it corroborated. And the internet, in particular, rewards these searches amply, repeatedly, because in fractions of a second, you can find websites galore containing so-called expert opinion that corroborates the view that we've already come to. And then we conclude that we have grounds, we have permission, as it were, to believe what we'd like to believe, and all else is beyond the pale. <laughs> Give us an idea that we find repellent, and we will now look for evidence that refutes the proposal. The internet accommodates us generously again. In other words, this is what the, how the author puts it, when faced with an idea we like, we ask the question, OK, can I believe that? And when we're faced with an idea we find repugnant, we ask, must I believe that? And when we ask, can I believe that, the answer is always, virt virtually always is, sure I can. And here's all the evidence for it. And when we ask, OK, must I believe that, which is always about the things we're inclined to reject, the answer is virtually always, nah, I don't have to. And here's all the reasons I don't have to. And of course, neither should you. This is how people are hardened and are isolated from one another. And by the way, studies have shown that IQ is by far the biggest predictor of how well people argue, but it only predicts the number and strength of arguments from my side of the issue. So now we understand a little more about how people may be standing together, but why they are so wedged apart. And how do we deal with this? How do we find some way of softening and ultimately forgiving if we have to? So here's another thing that you know, went around. It was uh, very cute, but very, 
very deep in its own way. You may, you may have seen it. It was going around, as I guess, as a YouTube by Hanan Harkol. It was uh, about a, a boy, a, man, a young man, and his father talking about uh, something horrible that this young man's erstwhile friend had done to him. He said, every time I think about it, every time I hear his name, I get angry. And now he texts me after two years wanting to get together to apologize. So what do you think I should do? And his father, after a long, very long pause, says, forgive him. Forgive him? It's the last thing I'm going to do is forgive him. I absolutely cannot forgive him. You don't mean you cannot forgive him. You mean you won't forgive him. Don't twist this around and make it about me. Well, who else is it about? We're not talking about what he did. We're talking about what you can do. And then he says, the father says to him, I just hope he's paying you his rent. Oh. Rent? What are you talking about? I'm talking about the fact that he's living inside your head. <laughs> he's obviously taking up a lot of rooms there. I mean, when did this happen? Two years ago, and you're still talking about him? So how much rent is he paying you? Well, living in my head rent-free, I never thought about that. It's just that I can't let it go. And this is, if you'll pardon this little, you know, little bit of levity here, because this is not, this is not light stuff. This is a different kind of housing crisis. <coughs> that people allow themselves into because of their righteous minds and because of their unwillingness in, in to, they, that forgiveness becomes weakness. So Robert Caron, in a, another wise book called The Forgiving Self, puts it this way. Alienation doesn't always have to be due to an actual harm, as was the case in this little dialogue I just rehearsed for you. It can come from just an inability to empathize with another person. It's not that you don't accept that person's narrative. You don't even acknowledge that it's there. We think differently just long enough with our righteous minds that we no longer see an alternative to our view, and we drift apart, perhaps even lose interest. It can be seen when children seal themselves off from parents. And boy, there are a lot of them out there on Colnidre night. It can happen with a spouse. It can happen with a friend. It's hard to imagine ever wanting to be close to that person again. But now, Karen says, let such people openly speak their hearts, reveal their pain, discuss the troubles or limitations that they experience, show sorrow for the alienation, and attitudes are mostly transformed. We're surprised to discover that we do care, that we've always cared, but that the caring switch was turned off by a retreat into our dens of righteousness. And you know the Hebrew expression, which I'll give you in English, don't be right, be smart. So now take a look at your sheet again here, and I back to the front. I want you to see this prayer for peace. <clears throat> again, Nachman of Braslav, it just happens happens, he appears twice today. I'm not a Bratislava chassid. <laughs> uh, we're not going to read this whole prayer. You've seen this prayer before, right? Adonah shalom, melasha shalom, shalom, se shalom, et etc., etc. But I want you to look at the middle of the fourth line, where he says, ki ata se shalom bimromcha, Viata mechaber shne hafachim yachad. Eish umayim. Uviniflo techa atzumim atose shalom beinehem. And then if you skip a line near the end of the next line, Shigit habru kol hafachim yachad bishalom gadol uviahava gadola. Viyuchlelu kol hafachim yachad bishalom gadol uviahava gadola. Etc. So, you know the artist David Moss. So David Moss was inspired by this prayer to do something rather remarkable. There's something by him on the back, but just give me your attention right now, because I don't have it here with me. I actually own one of these, but um, 
you got to imagine it now. Two panes of glass connected by a very clever kind of hinge. And etched onto the glass is this prayer, except that, you know, Hebrew letters, you know, the Ketav Ashurit that we use, mostly, there are a few diagonals here and there, but mostly these are vertical strokes and horizontal strokes. There's nothing more, we're back to Yachad Ha'am with his vectors, there's nothing more opposite than that. Vertical, horizontal. So on one pane of glass, David Moss puts all of the horizontal strokes of the words of Nachman of Bratislav's prayer for peace. And on the other pane of glass, he puts all of, what did I just say, vertical? But he puts the horizontal strokes. And you look at each of them, and it is gibberish. But when you bring them together, the two opposites now allow themselves literally to kiss. Not literally to kiss. Right? <laughs> so, literally metaphorically to kiss. <laughs> And now the prayer stands out in bold relief. Those of you who've seen any of David's stuff, you know, there's no, no mind thinks like this, you know, but he, he did it, and it's, it's worth seeing sometime. And he decided that this would be um, an expensive gift to send to someone from whom you were estranged. And he wrote a letter that's on the back here. So imagine, imagine yourself sending something like this to an estranged friend or relative. I've sometimes, I've sometimes fantasized about giving people 10 minutes on Yom Kippur, just find someone in the, in the congregation here you have to forgive or from whom you have to ask forgiveness and just go. It's completely impractical. You know, you go to the person and they find that he's off forgiving somebody else. You know, it could be very messy, right? And uh, I don't... You know, who would I go to? Uh, <laughs> but I hope this offering, this is the letter you send with this gift. I hope this offering will provide an opening for understanding between us. The strokes on each separate page of this work may be consistent and well-ordered, but they lack meaning without the other. Conflict has arisen between us, and like the two pages of this open book, I feel we may remain somehow incomplete without the other. Though it is tempting to nurse my wounds and rehearse my justifications, I'm adding, in my righteous mind. I do miss the relationship we once had. We're lonely. In his prayer, Rabbi Nachman realizes both the immense difficulty and the abundant blessings of reconciliation. By sending you these seemingly strong but fragile pieces of glass, I want you to know that I am reaching out to you to see if we can repair our shattered relationship. Let us speak frankly. Let us be open to compromise. Let us be open to negotiation. Let us abandon our rightness and seek wholeness. Let our wounds be healed, our hurts be comforted. I long for the moment when we can again embrace. It will be a magical moment, like the instant when these two sheets of glass kiss each other, reunite, and both regain their significance. How about that? Right. So this is, this is um, the second thing, uh, the antidote to this terror of the Ne'ila questions, first relationship, and now, not unrelated to that, the power and the courage of forgiveness. Now comes the paradoxical one, time with oneself. So someone dubbed what we're becoming now as a species, a new species, where he calls it uh, homo distractus. <laughs> The excessive amount of time with screens is both inefficient and suppressing of human interactions. I gotta tell you a little story here. I didn't intend to tell you, but it's a quick one. I had some teeno teenagers over at my house one Friday night, and I was sharing with them a, s a story. Uh, just, you know, tell me what you think about this. How do we deal with this? You know, everyone's dealing with, you know, if I walked into a synagogue and, and someone said to me at the door, you know, sir, you really have to take your wristwatch or off, I'd look at him like he was nuts. Right? Well, where are wristwatches today for teenagers? They're smartphones, 
No one wears a wristwatch anymore. And the idea that you don't use this in shul, it's, it's lost its plausibility. Right? It's just lost its plausibility. And how do you, how do you deal with this? Right? So I told him this story of, I saw a, a young woman who was there for a bar, bat mitzvah, and she was, you know, be sitting there very, she was not a bad kid, not trying to flout anything, just doing what you do, like I'm looking at my wife. So I sat down next to her. I don't like staying on the Bema very much. Um, and I sat down next to her and I tried, you know, as gently as I could to explain to her that this is just not in keeping with the uh, atmosphere and etiquette of Shabbat, etc. And she looked at me and she said, okay, I hear you, but I don't really understand. I'm being quiet. There are all these people who are talking to each other and no one's saying anything to them. Good point. Right? So I told this story to the teenagers around the table on Friday night. And they surprised me by saying, yeah, good point. But at least those other people were talking to each other. And then they opened up and talked to me about, they're into this but they're afraid of it because they see the, 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 the human relationship. This is what's supposed to be connectivity is becoming disconnectivity. And what is it doing to our relationship to ourselves? Someone wrote that the word identity theft is used much too narrowly. Uh, 10 million Americans may have information digitally stolen from them each year, but a far greater number of people are deeper victims of identity theft. Inasmuch as our identities, who we are, and our ability to recognize and relate to who we are in this hyper-connected society is being severely compromised. And this brings us to the crux of this matter. Henry Thoreau once said that the man who goes desperately back to the post office over and over again hasn't heard from himself in a long time. <laughs> and hearing from oneself is one of the core spiritual experiences that cannot long be neglected without taking a huge toll. I spoke about this one Yom Kippur about two years ago, two, three years ago. And I told him, you know, pay attention to the Torah reading. There's a holy of holies. And each holy of holies has a high priest. And that high priest has to go into the holy of holies to make it a holy day. And v'chol adam lo yiyeh ba'ohel mo'ed b'vo'ohel ha'kodesh. You've got to be alone. You've got your holy of holies. You're the high priest in that Holy of Holies. And you have to find the way to shut those other people out so that you can draw strength from that place of Kedusha. It's telling us that to be a kingdom of priests, to be a living a life of sanctity, a life of meaning, one has to have the capacity for significant moments of solitude, of being with oneself, of quietude, of what William Powers, who wrote a wonderful book called Black, uh, Hamlet's Blackberry, he felicitously called disconnectopia, the utopia of being disconnected. No one was to be on the high priest's screen when he was on his mission of sanctity, his mission of giving significance to his life and to the life of his community. Because to break the power of quiet solitude and privacy would be to make the mission fail. And we all know in our bones what that sanctity, failure of sanctity and meaning feels like, it feels oh so busy. <laughs> There's much at stake here because when you're inwardly content, you don't need others to prop you up so you can think about them more freely and empathetically and generously. So paradoxically enough, a little bit of separation and spending time with yourself is the way to empathy and real relationship. In solitude, we meet not just ourselves, but all other selves. And it turns out we hardly knew them. And we'd better get started knowing them. I spoke about this when I did because I thought it was, it struck me as one of the most basic spiritual issues. Ma'anu, who are we? What is our busyness? Where is it getting us? Can we find the Holy of Holies? 
I heard the teenagers still muffled the cri de coeur that Friday night. I care about the even younger kids who are approaching the age of 14 and a half, where depression born of excessive busyness now begins, according to Tal ben Shachar's research. They may not always learn these bad habits from us, but most of the times they do. Our lives corroborate and legitimate it for them. OK, denial and getting beyond it plays a huge role in our survival. There's a wonderful book called Denial by Ajit Varki and the late Danny Brower that describes how denial helps us as a species go on living. Basically, it's kind of a simple thesis, which I'll give it to you in three sentences, probably. Um, a dog sees another dog die, and it sees another dog die. Presumably, it doesn't now begin reflecting and self-reflecting on what that other dog's death means for his destiny. But people, when their brains developed to a certain point, saw other people dying, it created existential crisis. And the only thing that keeps us going and keeps us procreating is a certain amount of healthy denial. It's our gift from nature. But the very same power, when it's expanded and abused, can be horrendously corrosive. It can degrade our health, our longevity, and bring enormous suffering and sadness to those whom we love and who love us. What about denial for the things that we can control? You know, we often hear it remarked. You've, you've probably all spoken about this at some time. I certainly did. The confession on Yom Kippur is all in the plural. Isn't that wonderful, right? We're taking responsibility for each other. It's considered a good and wise thing because it bespeaks responsibility of all for all, and that's all very nice. But there is a problem with the plural confession, as you can probably now see from this little uh, meditation on denial. But I'm going to make it a little more vivid, and I apologize. I'm going to do it in New York terms, though I am not a, uh, I am not a fan, a uh, disclaimer. But did you know that together, Derek Jeter and I have 3,431 hits? <laughs> it's true. But you see, they're all his, right? We've sinned, we're guilty, allows us to say, yeah, it's the other guy. Sure, we've sinned. It's the other person who, in the pursuit of career goals, has neglected a spouse or children, and then, because the spouse and children say nothing, comfortably denied the probability that they would be badly affected by the inattention. It's the other woman who allowed a feud built on transient trivialities to take over whole lives that are now long, no longer whole anymore, and then denied that there was anything she could do about it. I couldn't possibly forgive. Our grudges, of course, are always justified. Our family has the balance just about right on how much to emphasize or indulge for their children the relatively transient things of popular culture and how much to insist on and to model attention and devotion to the things with ancient roots that will always be with us. It's the other family that's getting the balance wrong, just like it's the other man who becomes the statistic from heart disease or from texting behind the wheel. So we have to get ourselves beyond that denial in order to be able truly again to connect with other people and to give that meaning back to our lives. So finally, I began with the death of Mrs. Rabinowitz and how it got me thinking in my own eight-year-old ways of what I later understood to be the Neila questions. We come back now to this primal issue of death. So much of it recurs during Yom Kippur and it brings me to the reunion that I will never, ever forget is my 35th college reunion. It's been now also about eight years. So as it happens with college reunions nowadays, you know, they survey the class on all sorts of questions. They publish you know, the results of the surveys. And you see where your classmates are and what they're thinking. So fifth year, 10th year, 15th year is all about, you know, I'm doing this, I'm doing that. Oh, vey, I haven't lived up to my potential. I feel terrible. All my other people, all of my classmates are more successful than I am. It was all this kind of whining and preening all together. Here's what happened with the 35th. 
What's been your most gratifying experience in life? So here were among the answers. Taking care of my mother in her old age. Seeing my sons become men with good hearts. Watching folks who, folks who have worked for me get ahead in their lives and careers. What do you regret most in life? Deciding that growing up meant spending less time with my parents and family. Another thing I regret, hurting people, especially those who cared about me along the way. The time with my children and spouse lost forever to the pursuit of money and success. How have you fundamentally changed was another question. And here was among the answers from my classmates. I no longer feel that my whole value depends on getting the highest ratings. More humility, more compassion, both for myself and for others. I'm learning to be less self-centered. And what advice do you have for classmates? People are always more important than things. None of us is indispensable or irreplaceable to life on Earth despite our illusions. So get over yourselves and get an inner life instead. <laughs> Your kids and grandkids are not going to love you because of your resume. Now, what's the common denominator in all of these responses? And I've just given you a sampling. We repeated over and over again, just with variations in formulation. The common denominator, it seems to me, is simply this. They all reflect a gradual receding of the individual ego. And the question I began to ponder was, how does it happen? When does it happen? Why does it correlate to happiness and peace? Why does it, does it have to wait for the latter years of life? So here's the answer that's become compelling to me about this. And it's the last of these five things, these antidotes, which may have been the most puzzling to you when I said it, which is recollection. It's not about constructing fantasies about the future, but about recollection. Plato long ago said this. He said, as all nature is akin, the soul has learned all things. And there is no difficulty in her, that's the soul, eliciting, or as men say, learning out of a single recollection all the rest. For all inquiry and all learning is but recollection. And this, that reunion, and going back to that passage in Plato, was what got me to understand, finally, the import of this last text here that you surely know. But I'm going to give you a reading of it now. The Talmud in Nida 30b. Again, a kind of compressed version of it, taking proof texts out. Darash Rav Sim, Rabbi Simlai. Lamaha Vlad Dome Bimei Imo. How should we image a fetus in its mother's womb? Le Pinkasha Mekupal, a folded up tablet. They didn't even they didn't know about double helix of DNA, right? It's a folded up tablet. Ufiv Satum Vitaburo Patuach. Right? Its mouth closed. Navel open. Ochel Mimasha Imo Khalet Vishote Mimasha Imo Shota. Vener daluklo al rosho. You know, it's like a, like a miner going in with this, right? It's going. Vit sofeo ma bit mi sofo olam viad sofo. See everything. Ve ain lacha yamim she adam sharui betova yoter me otanya yamim. That seems strange. Best days of your life are when you're cramped up in a uterus. Um lamdino to kola tora kula. You know this. The mouth now opens, the navel closes. Right? The, the angel comes and gives him a rap, forgets it. Umahi Yeshua, what oath do they make this now to be born fetus take? Tehi tzaddik v'al tehi rasha. So we are tablets that contain all the truth, all folded up inside as if in our DNA, which is written in the universal language that is common to absolutely everything that lives. It's all written in the same language. Our navels were once open because 
connection to everything else was in some sense our most natural state because everything is connected. Our mouths, on the other hand, were closed. Why? Because the mouth represents the individual ego, individual appetites and desires, and the means of self-gratification. We could see from one end of the world to the other because we instinctively knew in that state what we will in this life only labor for years and years and years and usually fail to know that there are no better days than those days in which we instinctively know this fundamental truth about the connectedness and oneness of all. And all of Torah is taught to us, not meaning that we knew the Talmud or some other text better than we could ever imagine, but rather we are taught the Torah, the teaching of life, what, uh, what Michael Fishbane called the Torah Klula, the Torah of all in all. An understanding of what reality is all about, all that we knew once. And then came our time to receive the gift of our own unique energy and to have the ability to use it to contribute something of our own to God's world. And it comes with a heavy price, this individual identity, because the navel of connection has to close. The mouth has to open and the ego has to develop because individual life can't happen any other way. And in this process of self-differentiation, we forget everything we once knew. And so we're made to take an oath. And the oath is that we will recollect that which, may, which birth makes us forget. That we'll spend our lives using our egos to contribute to connections with the world and not for self-aggrandizement. Not for constructing a fantasy that feeding our egos and building our resumes and increasing our individual pleasures is what life is about. The oath is simply that we'll try to recollect the truth. This is what my classmates taught me about their selves and about myself, that there is a direct proportion between the receding of the ego, this envy part of life, as one of them put it, and the competition with other egos. There's a direct proportion between the receding of that and the receding of fear and unhappiness. One of them expressed this growing realization in this very compelling way. He said, Open up to the truth of your lived experience because we're approaching the foothills of wisdom. I love that phrase, the foothills. The peaks of wisdom are where we all once were and where we are heading again, not to be feared. They are where we can be even in this life if we can relearn the truths we were built to know. But if we don't relearn them, if we take our separate egos to be our ultimate reality, then we will be standing there as lonely individuals in this crowd, not knowing how to answer those Naila questions. And we will surely and rightly fear a future that we know will not be the world that we live in now. So can it be learned, and does it have to wait for old age? I think we all understand and know how hard it is. That, I think, is the message of the smack on the upper lip. You know, it turns out, you know, all the iconography of the angel of death, think of all the depictions of it you've seen at the end of Chad Gadya, right? Isn't this amazing in this text? It turns out that it's not the angel of death, but the angel of birth who's the violent angel. The stakes are very high because not learning these things is, I think, the very source of fear in life. And we can learn it. We've all learned it in fragments. And if we practice relationship and gratitude and forgiveness and overcome denial and let the ego recede, it won't have to wait for illness. It won't have to wait for death. It won't even have to wait for a 35th reunion. Maybe it doesn't even have to wait for Yom Kippur. But what a blessing it can be to have such a day. Thank you.